Is it now on mute? Yeah. How come? You can ask them. Hello? Hello? Yes, madam, you can hear you it. Not on, yeah, now do you, we can listen. Okay, all this time I was on Postpuri on mute. Now I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Good evening, sir. Good evening, madam. <laughs> Shall we start now, Dr. Patnaik? Yeah. Okay, we can Are wait there? one or two minutes, sir. Just fine. Yes, sir. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, madam. That's a good game. Dr. Sahai, good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Sahai. Yeah, good evening, madam. So gr gradually people are joining, sir. Two minutes, we can wait. To okay, okay, we'll wait. <clears throat> Why don't we start? Hello? Hello. Why don't we start? The yeah, we start. can start it. Just uh, one or two minutes. Uh, people are coming. And so two minutes. Very part they are joining. Fifteen minutes. <laughs> and we have fifteen minutes buffer time is there. Yeah, that's hardly proper. But anyway, two minutes from that will make a difference. So now the two minutes pass for so one more minute. Six six three will start. Six three six four. Yeah. Fine. You can start now. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes. Okay. So good evening. Good morning and good afternoon. For the final technical session of IWM7. Now there are very important talks are there, four talks. Before that, we have also a distinguished scientist dr m mahapatra sir is there to kindly chair the session so he just to give you a brief introduction dr m mahapatra is the director general of metrology india department and permanent representative of india with wmo and member of adjunct council of wmo with a phd in physics and 28 years of experience in metrology he has made significant contribution in involvement of early warning services of imd he brought laurel to the country from international agency for effective cyclone warning. He is popularly known as the cyclone man of India. He is the author of more than 105 research papers in peer reviewed in national international journals. He edited 18 books, seven journals. He received awards recognition from different agencies, including fellow Indian Metrical Society, Certificate of Merit for Young Scientists by MOES, and 25th Pineal Mosam Award. He is the president of IMS at present and chairman of regional sub project management team of severe weather forecast project program of South Asia and was chairman of WMO escape panel on tropical cyclone during 2017-18. Technical evaluation committee for consultancy of national cyclone risk management project, mitigation project. So over to you, sir, now. Thank you. Namaskar, good evening, good morning to all of you. At the outset, I welcome 
all the distinguished uh, uh, speakers, delegates, ladies and gentlemen for this special session during IWM 7. This special session is very important for each of us because it deals with socioeconomic impact of monsoons mainly. We have the leaders in this field, starting with Professor Sulasana Gargil, and Rohington Emmanuel, Professor Yushi Mohanty, and Nachika Pracharya, dealing with various aspects of the socioeconomic impact and related fields. So without taking much time, I would like to um, introduce our distinguished guest speakers, and I request the organizers to put up the slides for introduction. As all of us know, Professor Surajana Gargil is a known face in the field of monsoon meteorology, specifically, and in general meteorology to the whole world. He was, she was trained at Harvard University with a PhD in Applied Mathematics, postdoctoral fellow at MIT. After two years as a CSIR full officer at IITM, joined the Indian Institute of Science in 1973. She has made significant contributions to our understanding of the Indian monsoon and its variability, its links with atmospheric convection over tropical oceans and the relationship of such convection with the sea surface temperature. She played a key role in the establishment and nurturing of the Center of Atmospheric Science, Atmospheric and Ocean Sciences at Indian Institute of Science and spearheaded efforts to formulate the Indian Climate Research Program. She has served many, con many committees in atmospheric sciences and is a recipient of several awards, including Lifetime Excellence Award in Earth Sciences of 2016 from Minister of Earth Sciences. One most important point I just want to mention here, she has been the brain behind the Monsoon Mission Program of the Ministry of Earth Sciences, and she has spearheaded the various projects nationally and internationally for successive progress of the research and development in monsoon and its application to the society. Now I request Professor Sulasana Gargil deliver our address. Thank you. Can I have my PowerPoint, please? Can you show the PowerPoint, please? Uh, yes, madam, we'll show. Yeah. yeah. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Mahapatta for that very kind introduction and also the organizers for inviting me talk, to talk specifically on economic and societal impacts of the monsoon. The next slide shows the mean rainfall during the summer monsoon over India. And what you see is something all of you have seen before. This is the rainfall being high here and over the monsoon zone. What is of great interest is the variability of this average summer monsoon rainfall from year to year, which you see in the next slide. And next, uh, now we have a very rich data set. This is going all the way from 1870 to 2021. And this is the rainfall anomaly of Indian summer monsoon rainfall, ISMR, okay? And you can see that there is no, uh, no climate change here no change over the large scale, but the, certainly a very big decadal change. And this is the, this is very important, ISMR variability from year to year, because it has a very large impact on our food grains and GDP. Next. See, first of all, what is it? We would like to know what is the overall impact of the monsoon variability on food grain production and GDP of the country? What are our expectations? So, offhand we would think that deficit monsoon or drought will decrease the food grain production, FGP, and above normal or good monsoon or excess will lead to an increase in FGP. Soon after independence, contribution of agriculture to GDP was 50% and up by the end of the century, it has reduced to 23%. So, it was expected that because of this, and the overall development since independence, the economy would become quote unquote drought proof. The next slide will show you outline of my talk where I will try and see to what extent these expectations are borne out by actual data. So I will talk about economic impact first, observed variation of FGP and GDP, 
monsoon rainfall and FGP, and major features of the impact of monsoon on FGP and GDP. I will not be able to discuss strategies for maintaining ad minimizing adverse impact or enhancing positive impact because of time limitation. I will also talk a little bit about social impact, taking famines as an example. Next, please. Now, what you see here is a very interesting graph generated by a Japanese scientist. And what it shows is from 1900 and till almost this uh, few years back, what has been the food grain production of India? And what you see is, this is the colonial era, where food grain production never increased. It's flat. As soon as we got independence, it started increasing, okay? Even before the Green Revolution, because of the development work undertaken by the independent government. And then with Green Revolution, it increased even more rapidly. So the next slide shows you what, what was involved in Green Revolution very quickly. Green Revolution gave rise to rapid increase in Indian food grain production over irrigated in areas associated with rapid increase in yield due to adoption of new dwarf high yielding and fertilizer responsive varieties of rice and wheat mainly. Remember that it's primarily rice and wheat and a substantial increase in fertilizer application and pesticide application. It led to a phenomenal increase in the FGP, which made it possible for the FGP to outstrip the fast population growth rate. However, now we are witnessing a fatigue of the Green Revolution. Next slide. And what you see here is the Indian food grain, which has increased remarkably. Note there is no change in soap with Green Revolution. How much ever credit science may take, actually the increase began soon after independence. But you see in the last few years, it has slowed down. The increase has slowed down. And this is not restricted to India. Even in world food grain, if you see, there has been a fatigue in the Green Revolution. So next slide. Okay. Shows. <coughs> In fact, another uh, picture of the same thing from End of Poverty by Sachs. And what he shows is that this is the earlier colonial era, then we got independence, and then Green Revolution, which increased, but this is for GDP now. So this is his visualization of what happened to GDP of India. Next. Now, Indian GDP, if you look at it, then, of course, it is increasing exponentially, but the rate of growth earlier used to be what used to be referred to as Hindu rate of growth, 3.5%. It's only past the reforms in the 80s and 90s that we got higher growth rate of GDP. And you see here the change in slope. The next. Okay. Now, what is the relation to the monsoon? So, what you see here is monsoon anomaly, ISMR, and food grain production. And what is very clear is very close correspondence between droughts or large deficit and dips in food grain production. So there is a very close correspondence between droughts and minima in FGP, and this is well known. Next. Okay. So largest impact of monsoon variability is on production of rain-fed cultivated crops. Now, rain flood cultivation is over 60% of our cultivated land. Okay, so it cannot be wished away. It is here to stay. And changes over rain fed regions due to green revolution have been many. They have adopted new varieties and cropping patterns, in particular, changed over to monocropping over large tracts from what used to be a very complex cropping pattern. Now, this has led to major pests and diseases becoming endemic. So, these are negative impacts of the changes that occurred in rainfed farming due to green revolution. Next. Now, in fact, what you see is actually this is the yield of wheat that you see here. And you see very clearly the green revolution growth that took place, phenomenal growth during the green revolution. But this is a pulse tool and the pulse yield has not increased at all. So pulse is a rain-fed 
crop pigeon feed and you can see that this has not increased at all and what this means is that when with the impact of monsoon yields decrease the impact is much higher because it's fluctuating around a very low yield next okay so we did a quantitative assessment of the impact of indian summer monsoon rainfall on food grain production and gdp okay it is a surprise that no economist had done it but we did it anyway so this is published in the economic and political weekly my co-author is a mathematician and a statistician so although it is complicated statistics you can be reassured of its quality now based what did we analyze we based of course ismr data from iitm food grain production from ministry of agriculture and gdp at factor cost from central statistical organization next okay what you see is our result and this is where the surprise comes this is impact on food grain production on the y axis and this is the ismr anomaly monsoon anomaly and what you see immediately is that this is a very asymmetry in response you see rapidly it decreases the food grain production which means deficit in food grain production is increasing rapidly with increase in deficit of ismr but relatively speaking if ismr increases beyond the mean it is a very very slow increase in sdp so this is an asymmetry the same anomaly of ismr when negative has a very large impact and when it is positive it has a very small impact okay now this means that even if monsoon stays constant as we expected to losses will never be made up by the gains here so this is a very dangerous thing next now in fact what has happened is not only are we seeing asymmetry when we look at the entire data when we split the data into before 80 and after 80 we find that after 80 the asymmetry has increased even more with hardly any increase at all with increase in monsoon rainfall beyond the mean but in fact the 2 to 5 percent irrespective of uh, uh, this is the impact in gdp but impact being very large in fgp when ismr anomaly is negative okay and i have no time to tell you why but it is all in the paper it is because of climate insensitive agriculture the next okay so why asymmetry and why more asymmetry since the 80s so long answer i said is in the paper but i will give you a summary okay see deficit rainfall always leads to yields why does above rainfall above normal rainfall not lead to good yields harmful impact of the green revolution this is because now cropping patterns have changed to monocropping over large tracts and pests and diseases have become endemic also intense farming led to loss of fertility in farms in this situation even if the rainfall is good yields will not be good unless fertilizers and pesticides are applied you see this is a new element that has come because of modern uh, technology and farmers do not apply them in rain per situations in irrigated thing they would because they are not sure that the benefit outweighs the costs okay that it's cost effective so next okay now in fact if we look at gdp also then you see the same thing that I, negative ismr has a huge impact and positive has a relatively less impact and what is more is that gdp impact of deficits or droughts has remained between 2 to 5 percent throughout okay not right from 1950 till now so next slide says that despite the sharp decrease in the contribution of agriculture to gdp it is seen that the typical impact of severe droughts on gdp has remained between 2 to 5 percent throughout the period so question of drought proof economy does not arise irrespective of what you spend on development one has to think of better ways more climate sensitive ways of taking care of this now this is because although agriculture does not contribute as much to gdp anymore 
because 60 percent of the population is still part of the agricultural workforce so the impact of drought on the purchasing power of the majority still leads to a very large impact on gdp this is the reason next okay now i come to only one example of uh, societal impact okay and that example is that of famines okay and i say that because i would like to end on a somewhat positive note because this is a successful story of mitigation of social impacts okay now most of us most of meteorologists believe that the major cause of famines is the food shortage due to droughts okay and so a famine is considered to be the most adverse impact of monsoon variability i think people will agree with this this is what i also thought before i started reading up the literature now to understand the relationship with of famines to droughts let us consider what are indian exp experiences in famines the impact of droughts prior to and early in the colonial era was minimized by traditional social institution and collective use of farm revenues okay this made a big difference so they were not famines to the extent that they were afterwards but you see the policy of the british is to maximize the revenues so they did not bother about all these social institutions in fact they were systematically killed of collective use of farm revenues all the revenues had to go to the british so the major famine of 1876 78 96 97 99 1900 in which millions died in the colonial era were associated with droughts okay so it is true that when not managed properly droughts will lead to famine however after independence in 47 despite severe crop failures in association with droughts of many and i don't have to mention we all remember them 72 79 87 and so on there were no famines this is a point to note next okay the last famine one of the largest was the bengal famine of 1943 in which two to three million people died this occurred when the monsoon rainfall over bengal as well as ismr was above the average okay this i looked up the data fortunately thanks to imd all data are available very readily and hence could not be attributed to a drought so even when we had good rain we had the worst famine with so many people died now how why is this so the nobel laureate amartya sen attributes the total absence of famines in india since independence to the installation of multi party democratic system the contrasting case is china you know which has been more successful than india in economic progress which had the largest recorded famine in history during 58 to 61 in which 30 million perished you see, in a democratic system, no government can get away with people starving on a large scale. Immediately, media make a big fuss, and immediately some measures have to be taken to avoid starvation. See, this is not this kind of feedback is not there in systems like China, and this demonstrates the role of social institutions and governance in mitigating the social impact of the monsoon. I will stop here. I would like questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gargi. Now, floor is open for the questions and comments. So, if there is no comments, uh, I would like to. Okay, I don't find any hands. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Gurdjieff, uh, for bringing out uh, the various socioeconomic impacts of uh, Indian summer monsoon on food grain productions and GDP. He also clearly brought out uh, how the systemic change uh, prior to independence and after independence helped to mitigate the impacts, adverse impacts of the monsoon. It has also clearly brought out uh, how 
the role of societal systems and democracy play a dominant role in mitigating the disasters like droughts and floods in a particular society. <clears throat> so while we consider the reliance and self-reliance, suddenly we were much reliant upon others during the pre-independence era, and gradually we moved towards complete self-reliance. And as far as Southwest monsoon and its monitoring predictions and early warning is concerned, we have also come up a long way. I just want to have your opinion about what should be the fourth future course of action so that we can further mitigate the adverse impacts of the monsoon on the society and you can optimize the information on monsoon for socioeconomic progress in the country. Professor Gagul, madam. Oh, you know, that is a very interesting question, but will require another lecture. Okay, in fact, we have been working on farming strategies which can minimize you know the risks involved with deficit rain and en enhance the profit due to good rain but as i said it will require another lecture what is required is interdisciplinary research which involves also agricultural scientists crop models not just us not just atmospheric scientists and more important farmers because you know it is the farmer who has to deal with the whole system we can look only at the atmosphere and rainfall and pat ourselves on the back when the forecasts are right but the farmer has to manage the whole thing so that finally he makes profit you see so he is aware of the economic constraint he is aware of the soil fertility constraint he is aware of the hydrological constraint and he is the one who raises the right scientific issue this is my experience so it is genuinely challenging scientific problem which requires interdisciplinary effort and that's what i have been doing for past several years by collaborating with farmers from a semi arid region paugada you know who farm groundnut so there is an enormous scope for us to do better in agriculture of rain fed system given the kind of phenomenal progress we have made in prediction but also because of the enormous data we have on climate variability. Remember, variability is, gives probability, which is the zeroth order forecast. And the first order is what you people give. So with those, the opportunities are enormous. But you know, we need to work together with agricultural scientists and more importantly, farmers, so that we don't give recommendations that we think are proper, but which are actually useful to the farmer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, madam. We are really privileged to listen from you about the progress made with respect to the science of monsoon and its impact on Indian agriculture and Indian food productions. So thank you very much. May I now request uh, Professor Emmanuel to deliver the talk on new technologies and tools. Professor Emmanuel is Professor of Sustainable Design and Construction and Director Research Center for Built Environment Asset Management, BEAM, at Glasgow Caledonian University. He has long worked on urban heat island studies in warm regions and has taught and consulted on climate and environment sensitive design, building, urban sustainability and its assessment, building energy efficiency, thermal comfort, and carbon in the built environment. Rowington was the secretary of the largest group of urban climate researchers, the International Association for Urban Climate, and was a member of the expert team on urban and building climatology of the World Meteorological Organizations, as well as the CIB working group on buildings and climate change. He is currently the coordinator of um, uh, Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's Degree Program on urban climate and sustainability. So on behalf of all of us, I request uh, Professor Rowington Emmanuel to deliver the talk.
your audio is muted. Okay. Yeah. I, I hope you can hear me now. Yeah. Yeah. Now it is fine. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. My apologies. <coughs> Uh, let me put the screen. Okay, th uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the kind words. Uh, and uh, uh, it's my turn to now present something more esoteric. I think uh, in the in the previous talk, uh, Professor Gadgil presented some life and death issues about uh, food security and so forth. But mine is more on the well-being side of things. Um, although it may not be as uh, life threatening, but it, it could also be in the in the coming months could be uh, very, very much so. Right? So I want to present about the overheating problem a, a, in the urban areas of South Asia and with special reference to uh, Sri Lanka uh, and what uh, mitigation options are there and how uh, uh, the window is uh, rapidly closing for us to uh, uh, to be able to uh, use this. So my, my line of reasoning is uh, uh, to present something about the global increasing overheating and then fairly quickly come up to the human consequences of uh, uh, overheating uh, in South Asia uh, and uh, uh, then present some recent overheating evidence from in, in Sri Lanka and uh, some of our simulation works to see how this could be count, uh, what countermeasures are there and uh, to to reduce the overheating but to show also that the the the, uh, the window is uh, the window of ability to, to mitigate is is fairly rapidly closing and therefore some words on how we may uh, proceed uh, in the coming years so globally overheating uh, you might have seen of course uh, the ar6 uh, very was very emphatic it said human exposure to uh, global overheating is increasing everywhere uh, partly this is due to urban population growth as we know more and more and more of us are now living in cities so therefore uh, you would expect more people to be exposed so that is uh, partly the reason so it is not meteorological but partly it is also urban warming especially the urban heat island effect uh, this uh, paper you might have seen recently it came out last year it was trying to estimate how much of this uh, uh, overheating exposure is due to population growth and how much is urban warming uh, and in here they are defining uh, uh, extreme heat in, in an index a human comfort index called wbgt wet bulb uh, globe thermometer index uh, anything over 30 is considered uh, uh, fairly dangerous in wbgt that comes from a u.s standard and i'll show something later uh, for South Asia is slightly different, but just to keep this in mind. So that's the definition of extreme heat uh, in the last 30 odd years on the A panel on the left side is the total uh, increase in human exposure to overheating. It's about 2.1 billion person days per year uh, of which about two thirds comes from population increase and that kind of makes sense because uh, global urban population is rapidly increasing. Now we are a majority urban dweller planet, uh, but a third of it, 0.7 billion, comes from uh, the urban warming. So this then is, is also a key part of our uh, the evidence uh, globally. When you look at South Asia, much of it is uh, uh, urban warming, uh, partly because uh, uh, the uh, urban population growth is starting from a very low base, uh, even in very urbanized parts of uh, South Asia, including in Sri Lanka. The urban growth is uh, relative, uh, or the urban share is rel still relatively smaller. Uh, so the, the, it is it is likely that we will have a, a, a bigger effect due to the the urban warming, and that's seen here in this panel. And you could see that the sort of pink color in, indicates what share of increases uh, urban warming versus the green is more population warming and you could see in in south asia in general it is sort of dominated by pink meaning that we have more of our warming coming from uh, urbanized uh, uh, urbanization rather than in other regions so this is something to also uh, keep in mind this is of course only for extreme heat <laughs> and uh, 
uh, a little while earlier, you might have seen this paper for uh, the MIT researchers who are looking at uh, anthropogenic climate change and the particular challenges uh, that uh, we in South Asia face. Uh, this is in a slightly different index. Here we are looking at uh, the wet bulb temperature, uh, the maximum wet bulb temperature as the as the measure of uh, uh, the hazard, uh, the heat hazard. As you know, at, at a, a certain maximum wet bulb temperature beyond which uh, it will not be possible for human beings to live. Uh, that is usually thought as 35 degrees, at which point the human body cannot uh, lose heat anymore, even in shade. So that that's the sort of uh, extreme end of uh, the uh, extreme heat, uh, as it were. Uh, this is a, a little earlier study, 2017 paper by Immetal. And on the left side is the historic climate uh, data, but it plotted in wet bulb temperature for the last 30 years, for, so historic. In the middle is the RCP 4.5, so the, the so-called Paris Agreement uh, uh, emission scenario, so keeping the world's temperature, average temperature increase to two degrees or less. Even that is beginning to have a lot of red areas in parts of uh, northern and eastern India and also northern Sri Lanka, definitely in Pakistan and most of uh, uh, Bangladesh and so forth. But if you look at the right side, the RCP 8.5, which is the business as usual emission scenario, the, the picture is very clear that many parts of our, the, our county subcontinent would become basically uninhabitable, at least in the outdoor. So activities that require working in the outdoor, in construction, in agriculture, in all of those kinds of uh, fields, this becomes extremely dangerous. So it could become extremely dangerous in large parts of the uh, of the subcontinent. It's something then uh, to keep in mind. So it is uh, in this context that uh, we want to look at the thermal discomfort and the extreme heat in, uh, situation in Sri Lanka. Um, this is a conference on monsoonal uh, climates. So what is the recent trends in a very hot, humid monsoonal climate? Uh, Sri Lanka, of course, is, uh, is, is, is the tropical, the sort of uh, uh, exemplar of a warm, humid climate. It's almost on the equator. And uh, what affects the recent changes uh, or what effect the urban planning decision making could have on these recent changes on um, mitigation of the climate. So we take uh, the last uh, 30 years or so of data. For, unfortunately, not all stations had all 30 years. So it's 96 to 2020 from all these uh, weather stations. Most of them are urban stations. Uh, so we, we managed to have 20 stations and we're going to plot it on a thermal comfort index, not so much on a, a extreme heat index, but the, in the universal thermal comfort index called UTCI, and also physiological equivalent temperature. I'll say something about it in a minute. So according to literature, the very hot or extreme hot sweltering conditions in UTCI would be over 46. Uh, I wouldn't bore you with how it is consider, uh, calculated. It's a measure of thermal comfort. So it takes into account the radiation, the temperature, humidity, wind, uh, everything together. Uh, the, what people are wearing, what activities people are doing, all of that together. And uh, in PET, physiological equivalent temperatures, the same uh, sensation or same danger would be at 41. So just to keep that in mind, the UTCI here is extreme would be 46, very strong would be 38 to 46 uh, in the UTCI. And here is how the UTCI uh, uh, urban universal thermal comfort index looks in the last uh, uh, 25 uh, years or so. We have longer data, but I'm just showing the last 25 uh, years of data. And uh, those of you who know the geography would know that in the middle of the country is a very uh, high mountain, so 2,500 meters and above. So that's the only reason why there are some green patches in the central central hills because it is very high. Leaving that aside, even in 1996, the very strong heat stress was uh, quite rarely present, except in the northeastern part of uh, the country, but in, by 2020, it is very clear, a very large area of uh, 
the country is now in very strong heat stress and that uh, the the dangerous thing of course is this is just uh, this is only the the presence of the the hazard but if you look at the exposure where more people are much of these districts are rural so they are they are not so uh, very strongly uh, affected by i mean exposed but in the even in the colombo metro region you can see a, a very strong heat stress is now beginning to emerge uh, in sri lanka that that was in the uh, in the hottest month april here is the coolest month january uh, during the northeast monsoon uh, time the situation here too is also very very critically uh, reaching those levels so uh, on the southwestern side because this is northeast monsoon time so on the southwestern side of the of the country including in colombo uh, metro region the the moderate heat stress is beginning to appear this is in the coolest month so in a, in a tropical climate where annual variation is hardly anything and this is therefore uh, beginning to be a problematic uh, situation so uh, a, a, a problem climate is being made worse by uh, the the urbanization as well as uh, the global warming parts of it so very strong heat stress uh, leading to almost extreme heat uh, heat stress which hardly existed uh, a, just 30 years ago is now very common but also even in the coolest month this is beginning to be uh, moderate heat stress to the higher ones uh, that including in very uh, most densely po uh, populated parts of the country what can be done so we are looking at the literature what can be done and look at what effect uh, a green uh, infrastructure based uh, uh, planning or more shading oriented planning as they did in the in traditional indian and middle eastern architecture uh, so what effect these approaches to overheating mitigation could have on this changing rapidly changing situation in the country so we looked at uh, the street orientation, the height of buildings, uh, the presence of greenery, etc., and SVF is the sky view factor. How much of the sky is seen a, a, in an urban setting? The more the sky is blocked, of course, that means there are more uh, more shading. So all of this we are looking at and to, to simulate and to see what effect this could have on the overheating mitigation. Here is the situation in the last uh, 25 years and that uh, in terms of thermal comfort, the red dotted line is the limit of very strong heat stress. The blue dots are the base case as it is. Uh, EW means East West Street, a street that is running uh, along the sun path. Uh, with very little shading and very little greenery, it would always be, it would have been and it would always be will be uh, in the very strong heat stress. But if we had properly managed it, increased the shading, planted a lot, lot of trees, etc. although the R square is not so high, there is a slight trend that it, we could have uh, reduced this extreme heat stress to very strong uh, or moderate heat stress. So it, we couldn't have eliminated it, but we could have uh, helped to manage it. But as you can see, the trend, although is very uh, not so strong, it is approaching the very strong heat stress uh, limits. So our ability to do something to improve the uh, situation, mitigate the overheating while it is possible, but it is also getting um, reaching the thresholds of impossibility. So what approaches then could, could work? We, we would need higher shading, vegetation related urban planning. This is not part of the urban planning approach to climate change management. Climate change management in the countries largely still talks about emission control, uh, et cetera, uh, but not about the, the, the human uh, exposure to the overheating and what we can do in terms of our cities because more and more people are now beginning to live in cities so high shading vegetation related heat stress management need to be part of our uh, guidelines and so forth but even this would increasingly be difficult to achieve as the warming continues unfortunately the message is that if this keeps continuing more and more people would turn to air conditioning which of course then uh, it's a vicious cycle because that all what the air conditioner does is take the heat from inside the building and throw it outside where outside is already uh, approaching 
unlivability. So that would be wouldn't be an increasingly uh, yeah, yeah, interesting option. So as such, we we certainly need uh, policies uh, that reduce global warming and and working with the regional countries to re reduce the regional warming, which would be very important. But at the same time, we also need to do this local action, which uh, which enables people to. Uh, tolerate at least partially adapt to uh, the the approaching urban heating uh, large large scales of so this needs to be prioritized in terms of climate adaptation climate change adaptation action as i said that's still not the case so this uh, the, the role of urban planning needs to be also uh, presented there this is i think one of the uh, calls to the meteorological community to to uh, these climate services to uh, be targeted at the planning community as well. Uh, we need this sustainability intelligence. We have done a lot of this kind of uh, un this is all unintended consequence. So with, uh, the, the, there is a there's a need for a, a an intelligent way to approach the sustainability. Ultimately, I think this has to be linked to sociocultural sites because uh, the adaptation to overheating is not entirely technical. It's not just a question of planting trees and uh, shading and air conditioning. It's also culture. It's also behavior. So all of that needs to be also done. Uh, we need to also think of uh, uh, broadly uh, uh, system thinking. What effects uh, climate control, climate change mitigation would have on our quality of life? Uh, related approaches, so that too needs to be think, uh, thought about. A lot of countries and a lot of uh, uh, society areas already have the knowledge because they have lived with uh, extreme heat. Uh, this is not new to humanity. So there is a need for this co-production of knowledge. We are working with different stakeholders uh, and, and to co-design the responses so that uh, we, we don't uh, create some other unintended consequences as in the process of uh, uh, trying to manage the heat. Thank you very much and thank you once again for the opportunity to uh, deliver this talk and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Emmanuel. It was an excellent talk about the urban heating and mitigating approaches. Any comments and questions? I don't find any hands, but however, it was an, a very interesting study taking Sri Lanka as an example. And of course, for South Asia, it is a real problem as long as urbanization and urban heating is concerned. And your suggestions will go a long way in policy and planning. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. May I request you our uh, next distinguished speaker, Professor Yusi Mohanty. And I request the organizer to put off the slides for introductions. Uh, Professor Uma Charan Mohanty, uh, specializes in numerical weather predictions modeling in tropics with special emphasis on extreme weather systems over India. After superannuation from Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, currently he's serving as a visiting professor in School of Earth, Ocean, and Climate Sciences, Nayati Bhuvaneswar. He has developed, adapted, and utilized short, medium, and extended range prediction systems with mesoscale, regional, global, as well as multimodal ensemble models in academic research environment and transport for operational use. Professor Mohanty spearheaded the efforts to implement severe thunderstorm modulations and regional modeling storm program in South Asia. And he is a known figure internationally with respect to various field experiments, data assimilations, and especially the mesoscale modeling. For his pioneering contribution to Asian summer monsoon studies and NWP in tropics, he received several awards, including prestigious Shanti Sarov Nagar Prize, Sir Gilbert Walker Gold Medal, he has published more than 300 scientific papers in peer-reviewed journals, supervised 43 PhDs, and several MTech and MSc dissertations. For his overall contributions in atmosphere science, he has been elected as fellow of the four National Academies of Sciences and Engineering in India. So it is a privilege for all of us to welcome Professor Mahanti to deliver the talk. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
have the answer to some usual? Uh, yes, sir, fine. You can proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahapatra, for a excellent introduction. At the outset, I thank the IWM7 Scientific Committee for inviting me to give a talk on this soil moisture and its impact on monsoon. And I have uh, with me my young <coughs> uh, colleagues, Para, Manas, and Palas, who have contributed to this talk. So, uh, in my talk, actually, I will uh, give a brief background of this talk, but I will cover mainly three cons uh, aspects. Uh, I will show what is the impact on the land, what is the importance of land surface processes. Then uh, I will show its need, and then I will present on the a data set that we prepared for 37 years, with a high resolution data set on land surface, uh, soil moisture, and soil temperature, and its validation. And at the end, I will show impact of hydrogen land surface initialization, both on very short range thunderstorm, monsoonal thunderstorm, and monsoon depression to that of this is not scale prediction. So if we see that the Earth's surface exchange, exchange momentum, heat, moisture, and gases with the atmosphere and thereby influence the climate systems. The important land atmosphere coupling pathways are three major pathways. One is the water cycle, that is the changes in the evapotranspiration and its variability influences the precipitation. Other aspect, the energy cycle, that partitioning of surface energy like central heat, latent heat, mainly that uh, land surface plays a very important role in partitioning that, and as a result, it is dominated the boundary layer process because if sensibly is high, then boundary layer is larger or more deeper than the latent heat and vice versa. And ultimately, that leads to the formation of cloud and hence rainfall. And third aspect is the biogeochemical bio cycle, that is carbon and the nitrogen cycles, uh, that is also very much controlled by the land surface, land, land, area, land cover, and land surface processes. So soil moisture is a key variable that controls partitioning of surface turbulent fluxes. That is between the, as I told, the latent heat and sensual heat fluxes, and which are very different role in the uh, governing the convective activities and precipitation and so on. Understanding and representing the surface heterogeneity are important as they favor initiation of convection and have potential development of severe weather events such as monsoonal uh, rainfall and thunderstorm and so on. Indian region lacks land surface observations because we have only few observation network in the country, but uh, uh, they need a understanding and uh, representing the land surface processes and the realistic coupling between land surface and atmosphere is important for prediction of various convective processes. So the scope of the study, as I have already uh, Told you that I will go first to see the show you the need of land surface process, sensitivity of land surface processes, and simulation of monsoonal uh, rainfall events. Uh, for this purpose, we have used a high resolution uh, WRF model. So I will not go to details of the model configuration. Uh, So we have picked up four cases to demonstrate the need of the land surface processes. In that two, that case one and case three, they involve the month of the June, uh, and where actually the monsoon is in progress, and the central India and the northwest India having no rain. That means it is just a uh, source of heating and uh, development of the heat wave conditions in the uh, northwest India. And the uh, other two cases are a case of August, where actually whole country is covered with the monsoon and the uh, land is almost saturated with the uh, rainfall and which is uh, cultivation and farming and so on. 
So therefore, this is two contrasting period of monsoon. One is June, middle June, and one is the middle, other two is the middle August. And for this purpose, we have used two schemes. One is the NOHA scheme, and the other is the thermal diffusion scheme, where actually we kept the soil much as constant. In the NOHA, it is interactive. So then you see the verification of model simulated two meter temperature and two two meter specific humidity, then you can see that in the case of the case one, actually, which is the, again, month of June, and then you can see that a very good correlation between the heat, uh, two meter temperature, and uh, that observed versus simulation, and then, uh, the case two, that is the NOAA, uh, uh, and that is the August case. And this is the set of observations with which we have compared with the uh, Central India, where only few observations there. The NOAA shows a better agreement with the observations, and the influence is more visible in the case of one, that is in the case of June, where the, you can see they are highly correlated and all is following the same uh, line and with a uh, biases. Uh, 0.74 and 77 uh, for the temperature and the so also humidity. And in the case of August, we have little dispersion because at that time there is not much difference between the both scheme because that time already land is highly saturated. Then the C show that case one and case two, the dynamic variation of evolution surface field over the central India, and this is the temperature and moisture and Latent heat and sensual heat and latent heat process. And again, I am showing for the variability only case one and case two. And here also you can see that the, uh, the same thing is occurs that in the case of case two, there is not much change in both these uh, uh, schemes that we are using, fixing the soil moisture or getting the interactive soil moisture in the process of NOAA. And so there is not much difference between both in the sensual heat and latent heat process. And uh, also, but whereas we can see that in the case of June, uh, with the uh, TD scheme, we have more sensual uh, heat and yeah, more latent heat and less sensual heat process. And then if we see the precipitation, uh, this is the observed IMD precipitation but day one, day two, day three, and this is the NOAA scheme, this is the thermal diffusion scheme and where this is the difference between the NOAA and thermal diffusion, then if you see that the thermal diffusion scheme gives more precipitation and particularly over the North Soviet India and Central India. Uh, and this is all four cases, uh, case one and case three the, for the June and case one and uh, case two and case four for the August. So if you see that the NOAA simulated rainfall is better agreement with that of the IMD analysis, that is 0.25 uh, greater analysis, and whereas this TD is giving the overestimated uh, values, uh, then this is shows the moist static energy and uh, dry static energy and latent heat fluxes. The energy is integrated from the surface to that of the 300 HPA. And here you can see that this is the uh, energy difference between NOAA and the TD scheme. And you can see that the, uh, both in the case of one and three, that is uh, June month, where the central India, the northwest India is not uh, having the monsoon uh, appear there, then we have a large uh, differences, and which is substantially reduced when land is saturated everywhere. Then we have started the surface uh, feedback. So for this purpose, we calculate the, uh, uh, the term of moisture efficiency, upper transmission and precipitation efficiency. And then uh, the precipitation, that delta P, that depend upon the uh, uh, the efficiency effects, uh, 
the surface effects, remote effects, and residual. These four components that contribute the efficiency of the estimation of the precipitation from that evapotranspiration. So when we estimate that for the only four cases that we do in uh, case one and case three and case two, case four for the August, then you can see that uh, this is surface effect is quite dominant and more dominant in the case of the when monsoon is in the progress, that is the onset phase and progress of monsoon, and it is still prominent, and but less than that of the June, and when actually land is well saturated by the entire country. So this clearly demonstrated the surface process feedback uh, on the uh, precipitation mechanism that occurs during the monsoon process. Then with this study, then we have started the development of high resolution graded surface uh, data over the Indian region. And uh, as I told you, the India, we have only space, few places having soil moisture and soil temperature and radiation observations. Then uh, we want to see as an uncoupled uh, LDA system, how we can use these parameters and prepare the land surface uh, uh, variables, soil moisture and soil temperature at a different depths at four uh, four by four kilometer resolution and for this the eldas flow chart is very well known to all of you so i will not take much time the forcing at the surface fields like the two meter temperature and moisture and 10 meters wind and pressure rainfall and long wave and short wave for surface energy balance and then it needs surface parameter characteristics land land use land soil textures and vegetations so land is land cover and vegetation was taken from the NRSA Bhuvan. And whereas the other properties of land surface that is not available readily for the Indian region, so it was taken from the lookup table from the global data. And then uh, after land surface uh, data is generated, it can use for the verification as well as uh, for the uh, coupling with the WRB system and can be done model forecast. So experimental design that we have taken actually uh, different type of uh, data that is available that is Mira and Mira 2 and CFSR and ERA entry and GL dash data that are all available and we have the AWS stations observations over the India that is given in the figure here uh, and we select the four regions uh, north south east and west that is given in these figures and these are the observations points. And then we have done numerical integration are also conducted using the reanalysis data sets at four kilometers spatial resolution uh, for the period 2009 to 2013 first. And then this is the validation of LDAS input. Uh, that is what I told you that uh, uh, as you can see that the, the better match is there. It is NCEP CFSR, climate forecast system reanalysis, and also GLDAS compared to uh, ERA and MIRA data. So, and this is the error statistics that also signifies the same thing that the NCEP CFSR, two, uh, two meter temperature and uh, surface pressure and two meter uh, humidity are better correlated or better match with the observations and short wave radiation, long wave radiation is that of the GL dash are better agreement with that of the observations. Therefore, for the analysis, we have taken these two data sets uh, for the, and then we have carried out five numerical experiments to decide what type of combination is better. So experiment one is the CFSR, surface data and GL dash radiation. Experiment two, CFSR, hourly data, uh, both radiation as well as surface data. Experiment T, three, the ERA uh, entry data uh, of uh, surface fields and the radiation from GL dash, then MIRA, then surface field hourly you know, data and the radiation field from GL dash and MIRA interacting from MIRA products. So these five experiments are carried out that one type of combination will give the better results that agree with that of the observations and validations. Uh, here actually this is the plot of these all five experiments and that of the GL dash data and 
below is the Taylor's diagram for the root musical errors, standard deviation and correlation. And this clearly shows that in the experiment one, which use CFS and surface field and GL dash uh, radi radi radiation budgets at the surface, that gives a better than other methods. Uh, hence, those that things are used for the uh, uh, place money, uh, uh, money analysis of the surface fields at high resolution. And to compare that thing, we have used actually observation tower of um, IIT Khadapur soil moisture data. And you can see that Khadapur data is uh, the tower data and the TRM and the precipitation with that of the soil moisture that is observed and versus that of the dash uh, for the period of 2013. Then you can see that the uh, soil moisture is a little overestimated, but uh, almost they are in good agreement with that of the uh, observations. And then we have seen that the, the whole country that the AWS data that is available observed versus L dash data. And then you can see that uh, uh, north, south, east, west, all the sectors we have seen. So uh, this shows that the uh, soil moisture uh, analysis is a little overestimated than that of the observed. And this is the temperature field, uh, T2 uh, soil temperature again from two places. Uh, then this is the soil moisture distribution we have taken for the uh, above normal year 2007 and deficit year 2009 and normal year 2010. There also it is quite agreed with that of the situation with the satellite, GL dash and L dash. So L dash shows that in the uh, above, uh, 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 above normal years, we have the more soil moisture and the deficient years that is this and so on. Uh, so also the temperature is just reverse it is more temperature in the deficient years, uh, soil temperature and less in the normal excess years. And this is also ever normal. And then we have uh, uh, taken the uh, 25 kilometer, uh, 25, uh, uh, 0.25, 0.25 degree rainfall data of IMD and uh, uh, instead of uh, 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 that of the trim data, and then we carried out this analysis of three hourly data of four by four kilometers over the entire country for the entire period of 1981 to 2017. And then we have uh, made the composites and want to see that what happens in deficit years uh, and what happens in excess years, nine deficit years. And there also it clearly shows that soil moisture uh, uh, of Northwest India it is deficient and also uh, soil temperatures uh, base there. And uh, particularly, we see that deficient monsoon rainfalls have cool and wet spring, and that uh, uh, reflected in the rainfall in the subsequent monsoon period. Uh, similarly, that there are only three excess years are there in this period. Uh, that is of uh, so. Uh, that also shows the uh, similar type of concern that is in the excess monsoon have a warm and dry spring land conditions. Then we have seen the seasonal and the annual uh, soil mass and soil temperature trend and with the rainfall with the 30 years of trend for that 37 years data. That also shows the same control spring soil temperature trend is likely to link with the June, July, August, September rainfall trends. So that's why it is consistent and then we say, want to see the humidity and the wind at 850 millivolts specific humidity and wind. We show that actually as I show you that the Northwest India, they are actually soil moisture started increasing. It is mainly due to that actually the convergence and uh, and more soil moisture in that region and, uh, the, uh, and that is more in the month of June and it is quite less in the August where we have the early that is a period of uh, climatological weaker monsoon and then September where again it is amplified and in general it shows that whatever is consistent with the soil moisture and soil temperature with that of the this trend. I may conclude. Then we have seen the temporal correlation between uh, GL dash and L dash with that of the observations at four kilometers. So I'll quickly skip this thing and uh, 
I will go to the impact of soil moisture insulation of intense convective activities. That is uh, my Thank third part. And the, th the thunderstorm simulation during monsoon 12 July and 14 August, you can see that uh, when is the control, it is showing the overestimation. But when we have the soil moisture, we have taken from NOAA and our elders, see, they are quite agree uh, with that of the uh, what is observed uh, in the both cases. Uh, similarly, we have taken about eight monsoon depression cases and uh, 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 spread over the different years. And integration was done three to four days in advance. And sir, there also sir, may, sir, you may conclude, sir. Okay, sir. So I will go quickly this thing. And this show that actually we have uh, quite large improvement uh, takes place in the track and the uh, track of the uh, about 20% improvement in the track that we can see uh, if we take the soil moisture, soil temperature that we analyze and take the scheme like NOAA. So we have done also signal run and uh, as time is not there, I'm skipping that thing, but I'll come to the conclusion. So high resolution some four by four kilometer three hour soil moisture soil data are generated for the Indian region for the 37 years. Now it is estimated to 40 years. And the generated high resolution soil moisture and soil uh, temperature products have uh, good agreements with AWS stations, observations. Uh, the spring soil moisture and soil temperature is likely to link with that of the monsoon precipitation during June, July, August, uh, Indian monsoon rainfalls. LDS soil moisture and soil temperature have improved our simulation of uh, mesoconvective activities and precipitation, and also the track of the monsoon depressions have improved 10 to 20 percent with use of the LDS soil moisture and soil temperatures and with that of the uh, depressions and soil moisture uh, initialization in the CPC uh, has a better skill in simulating Indian summer monsoon rainfall. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your excellent talk. Uh, it is a, a new intervention in the NROP in Indian scenario, and it has uh, demonstrated with your work that there is enough scope to improve the forecast in terms of accuracy, in terms of the delivery to the various requirements, including the agriculture and disaster management. Uh, because of the shortage of time, sir, we uh, requested you to uh, minimize. Otherwise, sir, it will be very useful to all the youngsters and researchers in this field. Uh, any questions or comments? I don't find any hands raised. So, Shai, once again, thank you, sir, for your excellent talk. And we'll be moving towards the next talk. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. The last talk of this session is uh, on the new technologies and tools. I request uh, Dr. Machikata Acharya to deliver the talk. Dr. Machikata Acharya is a statistical climatologist and young and energetic, and he has contributed a lot towards the development in the field. He is associated with um, he is associated with the Department of Metrology and Atmospheric Sciences, Pennsylvania State University, as an assistant research professor. He has also held influential positions at International Research Institute for Climate and Society at Columbia University. And he has made significant contribution towards the understanding, monitoring, and prediction of short to medium range while working. National Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. He has also been associated with the University of Delhi and Bhuvaneswar. He received his PhD in statistics from Utkal University, and he is actively engaged in several regional climate outlook forum and co-leading the Building Block Three of Regional Information for Society under WCRP. Now I request Dr. Transkepar to proceed for his talk. Uh I just want to share my screen. Thank you. Please let me know when you can see in a presenter mode. Is it visible? In... 
presentation mode? It's fine. You can go ahead. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Thank you, organizer, for giving me this uh, such a big opportunity to present my uh, current and ongoing work. So today, uh, we're going. I'm going to discuss about some ongoing work on probabilistic multimodal ensemble using machine learning. Uh, the motivation is very clear. Like we saw the yesterday's talk by Dr. Pai that IMD was working on this whole MME system in a couple of years, and from last year, they are using MME in an operational mode. So although uh, it is established, but we need a lot of uh, research to improve the skill. On that note, uh, I want to say like that's my motivation. Uh, the highlights of the talks uh, I can uh, pictorially present that uh, we know there's lots of dynamical models, uh, especially with all couple models. So how to use the inputs of all couple models and doing a kind of explainable machine learning methods and prepare some probabilistic focus because seasonal focus for Indian monsoon should be in probabilistic way because there's lots of uncertainty uh, within the system. So with that, uh, a little bit of example, like why we need multiple models. I just took one example in 2009, which was a very uh, interesting uh, monsoon. So before, like, let's say we're in May 2009, and we have lots of output from the climate models. And looking at those outputs, it's very uh, uh, not sure, like, which model are actually depicting the real fact, which are going to be after four months. and. After the October, when we have the output uh, from the observation, and we see that the pictures, which is not same as all the models. So here is the one example in practical way when you go for the real time prediction, like how to believe in one model. Uh, so that's what we really need a multi model. Uh, now come to the before come to the probabilistic multi model. I was just want to I want to share that what are the work already has been done for multi model ensemble. So, you know, people are going for the simple equal weight to different weight based on their prior, uh, you know, uh, performance and combination with different linear regression. Uh, but most of the work is actually concentrated on the deterministic forecast. I just want to mention one pioneer work by Dr. Krishnamurti in 1999, who come with the idea called Super Ensemble. After 1999, like up to now, there's like lots of work on the deterministic forecast in the MME. But there's very few work on probabilistic forecast on MME, especially in the Indian monsoon. So just to explain like the, what is the probabilistic multimodel in a traditional way, I want to make sure that uh, the audience understand uh, what we're going to present. So basically, uh, first we need to calculate the probability from each GCMs. And there's a two way, one is non-parametric and one is parametric. Instead of going uh, the equation, I just want to give an example. Like, suppose one model has so many members, and members depends on the initial conditions, boundary, uh, boundary conditions. So, at the end of the day, we have lots of uh, output from a single uh, particular GCMs, and then we can simply calculate like how many members falling in each categories, and those categories comes from the climatological percentiles, and we can calculate a probability. Another way. We can assume some parametric distribution. Most of the cases, we go for the normal distribution, and then we can use a linear model uh, for the potential peculiarity comes from the uh, model's members. For example, you just take the ensemble mean of model members, and you then uh, convert this whole linear forecast to a normal distribution setup and get a probability. So that's the way like probability comes from the models. Now we're talking about probabilistic multimodel. Let's see in a non-parametric case, Suppose we have the probability for each model. Now the question is how we give the different weights. And the weights can comes in different approaches, very common approaches like giving the equal weight, which is average of probability, or giving the weights based on the members. Like if one members and one model has lots of members, give them more weights. But traditionally it's not working because not uh, it, it is not assumed that more members mean more skill. So we have play with different approaches uh, and uh, we publish papers on that. Uh, but there's a huge limitation on this counting method because it's not very straightforward. Like counting is working when you have uh, like few members, especially on the H2S scale where you have only seven or eight members. So it's always like overestimate of probability. Now coming to the uh, parametric approach, as I already explained, like parametric approach based on linear model assumption and the normal distribution. But there is a huge challenge is how to calculate the uh, spread of the distribution. And these are also lots of different way. We also play with different way and found some 
correlation based uh, uh, technique is actually works. But uh, there is again a huge limitation on the parametric. The huge limitation is first we have to do for a uh, two stage modeling. First two stage mean first you have to develop a deterministic MME. Then you have to convert in a probability. And uh, there is a huge assumption of normal distribution, which may work, but may not, especially in different sp like spatial scale of Indian uh, land, like not everywhere uh, the rainfall following the normal distribution. So on that note, we are thinking, what is the other option? Is it machine learning is the other option? Uh, now the question is like uh, machine learning is not like one particular word. It's a science. It's just like a statistics, mathematics, or computer science. It's a big science. So we can't we can't dig all the you know each and every uh, points of machine learning and try to understand which works. But as I am a statistics student, what I thought instead of machine learning, let's do for a statistic learning, we or a statistical learning, which is a combination of statistics and machine learning. And we can make a simple way to actually implement those kind of methods in the probabilistic MME. So does it work or not? We don't know, but we have a concept or we have a, actually a proof in a deterministic MME case. So long back, we published a paper on how to make a deterministic multimodal ensemble based on machine learning. And we found that machine learning actually uh, works very well, especially it's actually captured the all spread or the uncertainty or the standard deviation of the observation. So we have this uh, experience already, but there is a challenge. It's not a straightforward that uh, you use the machine learning for deterministic and that exact machine learning can work for probabilistic because the concepts are different. So that's what we started working on that. So we took a uh, method called extreme learning machine or ELM, which is, uh, I don't want to go much detail, but just uh, to explain, this is a very generalized, single uh, fit forward neural network. So we don't need a very deep because we don't have much data set in the seasonal scale. Uh, the climate model gives up 30 or 40 years of mind curve. So we can't go for a very deep learning method. We can just go a very simple method. A again, in a simple method, there is a lots of, uh, you know, layers and, uh, you know, different method, whether you go for back propagation, this and that. But at the end of the story, it's all, you know, leads us for overestimation. So we need to go very simple method. That's what I go for single feed forward method. And there is a math behind that. It's not like, a, you know, just we are, you know, plugging this black box and just working on that. So the maths tell us it's kind of a linear method, but using a very nonlinear activation function. And this is like, again, more maths. Uh, I don't want to explain, just to keep that things. Now the question is like the limitation, like the traditional neural network is always go for a binary classification. For example, in image processing, whether it's a you know a photo of a cat or black a cat or dog, it's very easy to use it. But in our case, in seasonal focus, we have multi-class, like you know, below normal, near normal, or you can make it like five categories. So it's not straightforward to use this kind of machine learning in that case. So we need to do a little bit of more sophisticated method. We found a very recent paper by Wong et al. that they are actually using this probabilistic output. And it's actually a difference between the traditional and the probabilistic output in the in the last layer of the machine uh, learning. Like, you know, uh, in ELM, traditionally they use a linear method, but here we have to use a sigmoid method. Again, lots of maths, I don't want to explain, but there is not like a method available and we just plug it. So we have to work on that. But again, uh, working on their method, we found there is a huge limitation because they use a log function uh, on the observed category, which is again leads us a very infinity kind of probability, and also those probabilities are mutually not like not mutually con uh, uh, mutually consistent. That means you get a probability, but if you take the sum, it's actually increase uh, hundred percent. So we have to work on the method. So we kind of change in, inside the um, uh, network. We change the different function, we found soft function is working and we also, instead of getting zero or 100% probability, we make some uh, decimals so that the log function cannot lead us very infinity kind of probability. So doing all those, you know, uh, uh, nuts and bolts and changing the traditional system to our system, which can actually work for this, uh, this method. So we, we come up with the idea. So in simple way, like suppose you have a GCN prediction, how to do it, right? So take the uh, output from the models and then you do some pre-processing, uh, min max or standardized anomaly, uh, anomaly kind of things. And then you do a kind of a one hot encoding, which is 
calculating this whether this uh, method uh, whether the category fall in below normal above normal near normal and solve different kind of activation function uh, we use that uh, relu and sigmoid and then you actually calculate different kind of category so that's kind of one schematic diagram of all complicated system come to the results like whether you are doing so much things so do you improve as results Yes, of course we do, but uh, you know we all know the seasonal forecast is not in a very simple way to get it. So this is the ROC curve for all India, and we get some you know more than 50% AOC, uh, which is around 60. Kind of moderate skill, uh, we can't expect that 90% or 80% AOC or AD under curve, but it works. Now the question is whether it's work for the spatial scale. So we actually calculate this generalized ROC, which is a generalized of all different category. And more than 50%, that means your probability is uh, discriminant, the different uh, incident. And we get kind of model skill. We don't say it's a best skill, but it's kind of model skill compared to non-parametric and parametric methods. We do need lots of work. We do need lots of hyperparameter of this machine learning. So that's the results. Now the question is how to do it. How, how can uh, we can contribute this method to the community, especially if we talk about real time for forecast. So it's not so easy to calculate those, you know, all different things because it's not available in the internet. We have to build up from the scratch. So we uh, develop a, a tool called Xcast, which is a combination of Xarray and forecast. It's available freely in in uh, in Python, in Panda. There's lots of example we put it. Anyway, anybody can use it. Very simple to use. So uh, this is the method you can, this is the tool you can use for that. And uh, I almost end in my talk uh, that uh, this Remax is like, you know, there is a various method to make this probabilistic multi-model, but we use machine learning as a white box to understand each and every steps and understand why it's working or why it's not working. And that's the way we are actually working right now. And uh, in future, we can actually add more methods. Uh, just one, uh, two take home messages especially using I have seen like lots of students nowadays are very excited to use machine learning. So uh, the thing is like most of the cases like people are very excited to use different packages available in different software uh, without understanding. But as we are dealing with the climate science where we have to explain each and every steps, so we really need an explainable AI. And basically the way I understand explainable AI is actually a statistics. So understanding machine learning in a statistic framework is much easier than understanding machine learning in an image processing framework because that's not our background. So that's what like the take home message wherever we use machine learning, we should understand each and every steps. On that note, I said thank you very much and uh, really looking for a comments and future collaboration. And uh, I, I was a little fast because I know this is the last talk of this session. I don't want to you know, go for more than the time I have given. Uh, thank you very much, thanks. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Machiketa, for your excellent talk on the new tools and data science, including AML. Certainly, we have to adopt the dual technology. On the one hand, we have the numerical modeling. On the other hand, we have artificial intelligence. Both have to go in a complementary manner, and that is the future technology for weather forecasting. Any questions and comments? So I find there is no question in the comments. So I thank you very much for your excellent talk. And I hope thank your you. work will help in future to develop this dual technology. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for the nicely conducting the session. And uh, we had this was the last session of technical session. So after that, there will be validity function the concluding session so we'll take a break for about two to three minutes after that we'll start the thing
कुछ हो गया कि नमस्ते डॉक्टर महापत्रा नमस्ते इस मैं ऑडियो इज ऑडिबल पटनायक ऑडियो इज वर्किंग मित्रा इट इज ऑडिबल ऑडिबल वर्किंग या हेलो डॉक्टर जी डॉक्टर मित्रा जी नमस्ते नमस्ते कृष्णन नमस्ते कृष्णन जी वी कैन स्टार्ट विद पटनायक सर वी कैन स्टार्ट सर सो वेरी गुड इवनिंग गुड मॉर्निंग एंड गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल आवर व्यूअर्स so this is the final and concluding session of iwm7 so we had very good hype day session starting from 22nd march to 26th march today so today we will be concluding the session as it was a very wonderful experience for all of us because virtual uh, platform we arrange this very such a big uh, international event spending our time morning and evening to accommodate many people from the different country so it was a very i feel it is very successful and it was also a very good experience for all of us so without wasting much time now i will request our dgm sir dr m mahapatra sir pr of india with wmo to kindly share his welcome address thank you namaskar uh, good evening good morning to all of you at the outset i extend a warm welcome to all the distinguished guests panelists delegates to this uh, panel discussion and concluding session of international workshop on monsoon we have with us professor cp chang co-chair idlm 7 professor ajit tyagi co-chair idlm 7 Dr. Yukari from University of Tokyo, Dr. Krishnan, Director, Institute of Tropical Meteorology, and Executive Director, Center for Climate Change Research, Dr. Ashish K. Mitra, Head of National Center for Meteorology Weather Forecasting, Dr. Pruf Kumar, the scientist in International Monsoon Project Office. in iitm pune dr patnaik and distinguished members of the organizing committee at the local level national level and international level in past 5 days we have come up with various discussions deliberations on various processes of monsoons the intrasseasonal and interannual variabilities the various large scale processes governing the phenomena they are teleconnections the impact of monsoon on various socio economic activities the monitoring predictions and early warning with respect to monsoons with special emphasis on numerical weather prediction modeling and use of data science the present scenario it has been a really a very successful event in spite of the threat due to covid 19 which has resulted in this virtual conferencing we have been able to organize with a huge response and participation the talks were of very high standard at the same time there was enough enthusiasm among the youngsters with their participation with oral presentations and short oral presentations and poster presentations the workshop could bring out the current status of knowledge and also could identify the gap areas it also paved the way for the further research and development and hence the new policy and planning to be adopted especially in view of the climate change and its impact on monsoon in present scenario and also the future scenarios 
I hope we have quite a good number of recommendations from various sessions, thematic sessions. And the organizing committee will take care of that and it will be documented, shared to not only the researchers, but also the policy makers and planners in the different countries dealing with the monsoon. <clears throat> I must thank all the chairpersons, co-chairpersons, rapporteurs for all the thematic sessions who participated for the success of this International Wars of Monsoon. My special thanks go to organizers, the young minds who are behind the hosting of this virtual conference. To further crystallize the outcome of this five day long international workshop, we'll have a panel discussion with eminent scientists, as I mentioned a little earlier, and I hope their thoughts and inspirations will crystallize our ways and means to further improve the monsoon monitoring, monsoon research, and applications for societal benefit. So I once again welcome all the distinguished guests and panelists for this concluding session of IWM7. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, sir, for your nice uh, introductory ses uh, briefing about the concluding session. And we have a distinguished uh, panelist here. We would like to hear from them. Some, uh, yeah, so it is very difficult for all of you to listen to all the sessions. So we will just uh, give a brief report of the IWM7 cover, covering the entire proceedings from starting from 22nd, uh, the initial day to the inauguration and what are the activity, who are the invited speaker, all this. So we have prepared a small uh, report of this thing. So I'll suggest our uh, team to kindly play that one. IWM is organized by the World Weather Research Program, WWRP, Working Group on Tropical Meteorological Research, WGTMR, with co-sponsorship across WWRP, and the World Climate Program, WCRP, Clevaur and UX Monsoon Panel and the WWRP and WCRP Sub-Seasonal to Seasonal, S2S, Project. IWM7, is organized by IMD, MOES, Government of India and WWRP Working Group on Tropical Meteorological Research, WGTMR, in cooperation with the WCRP Clevard UX Monsoons Panel, the International Monsoons Project Office, IMPO, hosted by it, Pune and Indian Meteorological Society, IMS, at New Delhi, India. History of IWMs The first IWM in Indonesia 1997 Second in New Delhi, India 2000. Third in Hangzhou, China 2004. Fourth in Beijing, China, 2008. Fifth in Macau and Hong Kong, China, 2013. Sixth in Singapore, 2017. And, IWM7 in IMD, New Delhi, India, 2022 at virtual mode. The seventh series of WMO International Workshop on Monsoon was inaugurated on the World Meteorological Day, 23rd of March 2022. The Professor Chihpei Chang highlighted the following scientific key message during inauguration of IWM7. The most recent CMIP-6 projected 21st century land monsoon rainfall is 50% larger than CMIP-5 that is greater news. However range of change also 50% larger which is not so greater news. The most crucial challenge seems to prediction of internal variability, namely internal modes versus radiative forcings, to reduce uncertainties in projections. The Senior Advisor of Integrated Research and Action for Development, former Director of General Meteorology, India Meteorological Department, addressed during inauguration of IWM7. Through the series of IWM in last 25 years, 
transfer of technology from researchers to forecasters has been brought out, improvement in forecasts are really commendable. This is seventh series of IWM is being organized by the IMD, MOS, Government of India jointly with WMO, WWRP, WCRP. The Secretary of Ministry of Earth Sciences, MOES, Dr. M. Ravichandran addressed all the delegates of this 7th series of international workshop on monsoon, IWM7, with following welcome message. We need to understand extreme weather under climate change and for all aspects the government of India launched monsoon missions. Whatever knowledge we gain in this IWM7, we will need to integrate into the models for better services. The Directory General of Meteorology, DGM, India Meteorological Department, IMD, Dr. M. Mohapatra addressed all the delegates of this 7th series of International Workshop on Monsoon, IWM7, with following welcome message. This IWM7 will bring capacity of the knowledge transfer from older generation to the younger generation, senior scientists to younger research scholars, and help us for better understanding about current research about monsoons in India and other parts of the world and plan for future research and better progress towards it. The head of World Weather Research Program, WWRP, of World Meteorological Organization, WMO, Dr. Estelle de Koning addressed all the delegates of this seventh series of international workshop on monsoon, IWM7, with the following welcome messages. The monsoon systems has huge impact on both economical and social, and company to the high impact weather events, and also links to meteorology, climatology, hydrology, agriculture, and water resource management at all time scales. This information is much needed by the decision maker for early warning and early actions. To establish much needed dialogue between scientists and users on monsoon information, this workshop IWM7 is most important one. The head of World Climate Research Program, WCRP, of World Meteorological Organization, WMO, Dr. Michael Sparrow addressed all the delegates of this seventh series of international workshop on monsoon, IWM7 with the following welcome messages. This IWM7 is a hub to bring global scientists together and continue to expand research on global monsoons in current and future projections and improvements of its predictability. We will continue to focus on research in sub-seasonal to seasonal, S2S, and climate future projects of global monsoons with more international and national partners. Sir Gilbert Walker Gold Medal is awarded for the scientific contributions in the fields of monsoon meteorology including long-range forecasting of monsoon, forecasting of monsoon systems including tropical cyclones, and for overall contribution to the development of meteorology in India. The Sir Gilbert Walker Gold Medal consists of a citation, a medal, and award money of Rs 1 lakhs. In recognition of outstanding contribution to monsoon meteorology, the Indian Meteorological Society awarded the Sir Gilbert Walker Gold Medal of the Indian Meteorological Society for the year 2019-2020 to Prof. Dr. P. V. Joseph, on the WMO Day of 23rd of March, 2022, to honour his lifetime contributions towards discovery of new phenomena understanding of the atmospheric and other processes and developing meteorological services for societal benefits. During the inauguration, the book containing all the abstracts of IWM7 was released by the Secretary MOES, Dr. M. Ravichandran, DGMIMD Dr. M. Mohapatra, and Coordinator, IWM7 Dr. D. Apatanayak. Warm welcome message from Prof. Petri Tala's Secretary General. WMO during formal inauguration of IWM7 on 23rd of March 2022. Dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the World Meteorological Organization or, and uh, on my own behalf, uh, I would like to express uh, WMO's appreciation to address the seventh international workshop on monsoons. I would like to thank the government of India, in, especially Ministry of Earth Sciences and the India Meteorological Department uh, for hosting this online scientific event which speaks of importance uh, that India assigns uh, to the vital climatic and environmental challenges that the international community faces today. I would like to congratulate the Indian government for taking several initiatives to tackle these climate and natural 
hazard issues. India is one of the few leaders in the implementation of the Paris Agreement on climate change. It has a national clean air program to combat air pollution because you are facing one of the most uh, uh, difficult uh, air quality problems worldwide. You are a founding member of the International Solar Alliance and has been notable targets related to solar power, power energy. The Indian government has initiated several flagship projects on environment, clean India, clean Gangstam, smart cities mission, to name a few. It is also in the forefront uh, in weather and climate uh, research. According to IPCC's uh, sixth assessment report, the Northern Hemisphere land monsoon rainfall as a whole declined from 1950 to 1980 and rebounded after the, the 80s due to competing influences of uh, internal climate variability and radiative forcing from rising greenhouse gas uh, concentrations and aerosol forcing. Increases in, in monsoon precipitation due to warming of the, from greenhouse gas emissions uh, were, were counteracted uh, by decreases in monsoon precipitation due to cooling from human-caused aerosol emissions over the 20th century. National Meteorological and Hydrological Services to fulfill its fundamental mission to provide increasingly better services not only to your respective national communities in protecting life and property and in support of uh, sustainable development, uh, but the global community as a whole. I can ensure you that WMO will be at your side throughout this vital humanitarian in endeavor. I wish to thank once again Dr. Mohapatra for his kind invitation to his in entire team for the excellent coordination arrangement uh, in organizing this online monsoon wor workshop. To all participants of this workshop, uh, your presence today speaks of your deep commitment uh, to continue working together towards a safer world. May your collective endeavors uh, in this workshop uh, be fruitful. Thank you all for your kind attention. Warm welcome message from Dr. Jaitendra Singh, Honorable Minister of Earth Sciences, Government of India during formal inauguration of IWM7. Namaste, I welcome you all to this uh, international workshop on monsoon being hosted by the India Meteorological Department, Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India. Ladies and gentlemen, you will be pleased to know that India is blessed with two monsoons. The southwest monsoon during the month from June to September and the northeast monsoon during October to December. Here, under the leadership of Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi, has launched an ambitious and a well resourced research program on mission mode called the Monsoon Mission. Through this mission, ladies and gentlemen, India has augmented its capability of high performance computing, the HPC, which is close to 10 petaflops now and is able to generate forecast a very high resolution with 3 kilometer resolution using meso scale model, 12 kilometer using global forecast system model and about 38 kilometer using ocean atmosphere coupled model. The monsoon mission has therefore and thus helped in the significant improvement of monsoon forecast in all the time scales, right from short range to seasonal. The second phase of monsoon mission also focuses on sectoral applications and prediction of extreme weather. Substantial support is being provided by the Government of India headed by Prime Minister Narendra Modi under the, his guidance for monsoon research through the monsoon mission which has successfully completed two phases and is about to embark on the third phase from this year. The International Workshop on Monsoon is a major Radial Symposia Workshop Series under the World Weather Research of the World Meteorological Organization, namely the DFWMO. The seventh workshop in the series is being organized at New Delhi, India, jointly by India Meteorological Department of Earth Sciences, Government of India, and the WWRP, that is the Working Group on Tropical Meteorological Research, WTTMR, in cooperation with 
monsoons panel of the World Climate Research Program WCRP and the International Monsoon Project Office INPO, hosted by the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology IITM and Indian Meteorological Society the IMS. To conclude, I wish the seventh edition of International Workshop of Monsoon a great success, and I'm sure we'll come out with some very valuable conclusions and inferences. Thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen, and Namaste. Various researchers from 18 different countries contributed their work in the IWM7. There are total 185 abstracts in which 55 participants are from outside India and 20 additional registered participants are also attended the workshop. There are 185 papers were presented on nine different themes namely regional monsoons, S2S predictions, modeling monsoon processes, climate change and monsoons high-impact monsoon weather, field experiments, and observational campaigns, monsoon information and prediction for societal benefit, and new technologies and tools. Total 38 invited talks in 9 sessions, total 72 oral talks in 12 parallel sessions, and 75 short oral talks in 3 sessions were conducted during this 5 days workshop IWM7. A special issue of Quarterly Journal of Meteorology, Hydrology and Geophysics MOSM from this workshop IWM7 will be published under the editorial team with Chief Guest Editor Professor Chihpei Chang. Thank you. Thank you for our team to bring this um, a brief report highlighting the different activity from beginning first day to last day. So now with this, uh, now I request uh, our PGM sir, Mahapatra sir, to kindly start the panel discussion. And we have the panelists uh, to take their views and comments on this. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patnaik, uh, for uh, this excellent uh, review of the activities uh, taken out during these last five days. Now we'll proceed for this uh, panel discussion. The topic for the discussion is the future monsoon forecasting. And we have Professor C.P. Chang, Professor Ajit Tyagi, Dr. Yukari Akayevu, Dr. R. Krishnan, Dr. Asis K. Mitra, Dr. Ruf Kumar Poli. So we will take about 40 minutes for discussions. And I will request each of our distinguished panelists to speak for about three to four minutes maximum. So we can go for three minutes on the first round, then we can come up again if required to the second round with one minute or so for a concluding statement. So at first I request Professor C.P. Chang to keep his views on future of monsoon forecasting. Your audio is muted. Audio, audio, your audio. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, I must congratulate uh, Dr. Mahapatra, uh, uh, Director General of IMD, and the super uh, outstanding uh, achievement of uh, sponsoring and hosting uh, this workshop. Everything is beyond my wild uh, uh, dream. Uh, on the success and and also he has a very strong team, including Dr. Patanak and uh, other IMD colleagues. And also uh, we need to thank very much uh, the leaders and the staff of IMPO uh, and others. Too many to to mention. Uh, for IWAM, uh, this uh, started uh, was kind of like a an accident actually when I think about it, it traced back to uh seven I'll have to say nineteen ninety five. Uh there was a meeting in Beijing, a, a small meeting in Beijing and uh and then we talk about the possibility of have this and the the person the head of a uh, working group of tropical meteorological research uh, was uh, Dr. 
uh, Great Holland of Australia uh, uh, Weather Bureau, uh, Meteorological Bureau. But anyhow, uh, in order to make this uh, workshop different from all the other normal regular workshops, there are tons of monsoon meetings. And in the very beginning, actually, when I got involved, uh, also by accident in Bali, uh, I had a talk with uh, Great Holland, and we, we think it would be better to have the workshop as organized so that uh, it's not like everybody just submit a paper and uh, and all come here and give a talk, but we should organize in such a way that there's a structure to can cover various part of uh, uh, the important topic of monsoon research and as part of WMO activity should be closely related to forecasts. So that would differ from the other academic type of uh, workshop. And finally, we're seeing that uh, this is uh, gradually being <clears throat> sort of accomplished uh, as IWM proceeds. I remember uh, back in uh, IWM2 uh, in Delhi, uh, there was a lot of training, but the science part was separate in the first week. And then we, in 2015, we went back to Delhi. That was the Monsoon Heavy Rainfall Workshop. And it was great that uh, a lot of uh, both academics and uh, uh, forecasters participated. And finally, here, I think in the future, uh, the Monsoon research needs to involve both uh, communities. It can't just be those people who can uh, do great research and, and produce great science and write great papers, but we must also have forecasters and uh, they would come in and bring up uh, their problems and their interests and their challenges. And it, it, it's, too, it's obvious we have a lot of challenges in front of us. And uh, this is a very good uh, sort of, it's not starting point, but it's a very good intermediate point of IWM7. Uh, and with the heavy involvement of a weather service, that is the IMD. So we should continue uh, in this path. We should uh, uh, bring both communities and work together. And I hope that uh, IMD and IAMPO will continue to play uh, leadership roles in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Chang. You have correctly brought out uh, the historical evolution and the objective of this workshop and uh, the way forward. May I now request uh, Professor Ajit Tyagi, the co-chair of IWM7. So Thank you, Dr. Mahap. Thank you, Dr. Mahapatra, Professor Chang, and esteemed co-panelists. It's a great honor to be part of this esteemed panel. And at the outset, uh, let me also convey thanks to the India Med Department for having successfully organized this workshop despite various challenges posed by the pandemic. Now, as far as the monsoon research in the recent decades has concerned, it has positively led to the significant improvement in the weather forecast. But still, there are gaps, particularly I like to focus three areas. First is that localized high impact weather, the heavy rainfall events. Second is sub-seasonal to seasonal variability of active break cycle and leading to droughts in some cases. And third at the climate scale, the projection at the sub regional to the local scale for effective adaptation strategies. Another thing which is, is being brought out again is that this provides a platform from scientists to the forecasters to the users. Somehow, in the coming years, most important thing is to the delivery of the forecast to the users and user specific applications. So this is one area which the value addition needs to be brought in. Uh, both by handholding of the monsoon meteorologist and the user sector. Uh, now, just two days back, uh, UN Secretary General has brought out the importance of um, and launched a five year project of delivery of the weather forecast and early warnings to the last man in the globe. This five year project will be led by the World Meteorological Organization. And the most affected areas for this is the monsoon region. One third of the population in the least developing and developing countries lie in the monsoon region, and 60% of these are from the African countries. 
uh, one of the weak areas of this monsoon workshop had been that we didn't have adequate representation from African countries. So we need to develop a monsoon meteorology community in the in the African countries. And another is also very active participation of the user community in our future workshops. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Professor Tegisa, for your uh, excellent uh, summary of the achievement of this workshop and your views for the future work. May I now request uh, Dr. Yukari Takayabu for his valuable comments. Namaste. Yeah, yes, please, madam. Okay. Uh... Thank you very much. It was my uh, honor to uh, attend this workshop. And uh, first, I would like to congratulate Dr. Mohapatra and uh, and thank uh, Dr. Patanaik and all the IWM7 organizers for a very successful five-day monsoon workshop. I also would like to thank all the presenters for wonderful lectures. I found this workshop consists of monsoon studies from a very wide range of views. I learned a lot from historical views to the novel methodologies uh, to understand monsoon variabilities in various spatial and temporal scales. Monsoon weather and climate are very complex systems, difficult to understand and to fo focus. Uh, but I find scientists are successfully proceeding to un untangle the complex monsoon systems. I really enjoyed this workshop and I hope these further efforts, collaborations, will help to achieve and for the sustainable development goals for our society. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Dr. Ipari, for your uh, views. May I request Dr. R. Krishnan, Director, Institute of Tropical Meteorology, also the Executive Director for Climate Change Research for the views. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Mohapatra ji, uh, chair of uh, chair of this session, and DGIMD, and I also want to thank uh, uh, all the panelists today, um, Professor C P Chang, co-chair of IWM seven, uh, Professor Ajit Tyagi is also a co-chair of IWM seven, Professor Yukari Yukari Takayabu. Uh, co-panelists, Dr. Ashish Mitra, Dr. Rupakumar Kulli, and Dr. Patnaik, who has done a great job. Uh, many thanks to all, all of you. It's a great honor for me to participate in this uh, as a panelist. And uh, let me congratulate uh, Dr. Mahapatra, uh, Dr. Patnaik, and the entire team of all the organizers who have done an extraordinary job. And this has been a very, very successful event. It is a grand success. and. Uh, First of all, all the topics were very well structured, uh, the uh, wide range of topics. It covered all the all the monsoon regions of the world, the, the talks especially, and uh, excellent high quality presentations. They were really outstanding. And uh, many young early career scientists also presented. And uh, this made it very, very impressive. And I also want to particularly thank IMPO and IATM along with IMD who played a key role and uh, provided leadership in organizing this workshop. And uh, uh, so uh, with this, the future regarding the future of uh, monsoon forecasting. Uh, so with the climate change, uh, these extreme events are becoming more uh, frequent. And one of the challenges in the monsoon region is uh, uh, the heavy precipitation during the monsoon season, they are coupled to the circulation. Uh, and there are mesoscale convective systems which organize and which can produce very heavy rainfall and which came out in many of these present talks today. Also, land surface processes, uh, air sea interactions, they are on different time scales <coughs> and um, internal variability which is affecting these 
extreme precipitation. Uh, so on the one hand, we need the basic research to understand the underlying processes uh, to be able to improve the models, um, uh, uh, representation of these pro processes in the models. And uh, so understanding of the process and uh, the representation in model is very important. And the second thing is prediction. So we definitely need high, high resolution models, which we are already going. And um, also data assimilation is going to be a key uh, because especially with uh, increasing moisture in the atmosphere, water vapor is going to be a key parameter. And uh, in addition to the winds, uh, vertical structure of the winds, and uh, now with AIML and new techniques, probably with more data be becoming available, hopefully we may be able to improve some of the key physical processes in the models. And, um, and of course, this region, the monsoon, the Himalayas is a very important region where today morning also there's, there's showed very strong diurnal variability in the precipitation as, as well as links to subseasonal variations like the QBO and BSISO. So internal variability is a very important uh, uh, source of uncertainty uh, besides various drivers like greenhouse gases and aerosols and land use changes. So these are grand challenges, pro challenging problems which we need to address in the future. And uh, I am sure the IMPO will be a, a great platform because it brings in together the expertise from WWRP and WCRP and all the regional monsoons. and. Uh, I'm looking really looking forward to uh, the successful predictions on the monsoon in the future. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Director Krishnan, for uh, bringing out the issues at hand yeah. and the suggestions for the future work to improve the monsoon forecasting. You have correctly brought out the need for further research and improvement in forecasting the internal dynamics and hence the internal variability of monsoon. You have correctly brought out the role of uh, land use changes and the aerosols, which are the new emerging areas and likely to impact and hence taken to be consideration in view of the ongoing climate changes. The role of regulations and physics and physical processes, as well as the combination of data science, also you have brought out that could be the future research for improvement of monsoon forecasting. So thank you very much. Now I may now I request that Ashish Mitra, head of National Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. And this center is basically dealing with the seamless forecasting from now casting to extended and seasonal forecasting of monsoon. Let Mitra may give your views, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahapatra. First, let me congratulate uh, IMD, Dr. Mahapatra, and the whole team for this very successful uh, workshop and the chairs and co-chairs of uh, IWM7. It's a fantastic uh, workshop last five days. And uh, I didn't feel that it was online and we lost something because it has generated a wealth of presentations which are available in YouTube and uh, recordings are available. So I think uh, the younger students and even will come back and uh, refer to all the presentations and talks again and again. So it's a fantastic uh, uh, wealth of knowledge which will be available over the internet. So congratulations for that. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, the co-chairs. Uh, for giving me this opportunity. So what I feel uh, for advancing this monsoon research, uh, when we look back uh, from this workshop and uh, recent publications, this reanalysis data sets have advanced our knowledge, both the satellite data and the reanalysis. So reanalysis of the atmosphere, ocean, land surface. So tremendous understanding of the monsoon at different scale has happened. So that is one work which has to continue. Uh, with uh, very high resolution reanalysis. So like our Ministry of Water Sciences has produced under monsoon mission, regional reanalysis for Indian region, 40 years and 12 kilometer, very high resolution. And there are 18,000 users already uh, using that to churn out new knowledge. So that kind of ocean atmosphere and uh, 
uh, land surface reanalysis data has to be produced, which will be very valuable for understanding the monsoon. And because of the HPC and satellite data and other radar data, the model resolution has improved. So there is a lot of improvement in the monsoon uh, modeling. But still, for the world community, the monsoon modeling is a change. So it's a good thing for uh, South Asian region and our people that uh, whole international community is attracted and like a benchmark the any modelers will come back and see how good or bad is the monsoon what are the biases whether the teleconnections are good or not so that uh, india government also put a lot of resources in monsoon mission so i think uh, the monsoon research is very encouraging because it's a challenge for the scientific community so all the scientists are attracted to work on this and i think government of india will continue to support uh, research in this uh, monsoon related topics and uh, uh, the uh, last item i would like to focus which dr krishnan has also told the initializing the model see we may develop high resolution model but the data gaps particularly some regions of the globe and the difficult mountain terrains, uh, we don't have any data. So the models are improving. So we are not able to validate the model because model validation and diagnostics are important part of model development. So how to, uh, we may need uh, WMO's uh, help and some other cooperation to put extra observation or through satellites, the difficult terrain like mountain, deserts, and um, the cryosphere collecting this data and validating the model. Uh, and one research particularly I remember, uh, our great uh, monsoon scientist, Professor T.N. Krishnamurti. So he used to do a work on scale interaction. So the scale interaction diagnostics, it brings out the deficiencies in the model. So that kind of uh, diagnostic has to be continued See, because uh, the models are there, but the multi-scale, uh, complex, uh, uh, coupled system of the monsoon, we are not able to properly diagnose that what to do if we do make some changes in the convective scale, the benefit we are getting or not. So diagnostics remains an important point which has to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitra. So you have... Uh... Uh, correctly uh, identified the gaps in the regional monsoon, especially the role of uh, the data sparse oceans and hills, like the Himalayas, where we have to augment the observational network and we have to understand the physical processes occurring in these regions. We also highlighted the continuity required for reanalysis studies with higher resolutions and better understanding of the knowledge. The role of data assimilations, yes, certainly it has to improve it is a continuous process along with the resolutions and physical processes. The scale interaction is another area where we have to improve our diagnosis and to have, for example, assimilations for casting and better understanding. The most important point, whatever you have brought out, that is uh, the collaboration among the various R&D institutions. That is also a key to the success so far under the umbrella of World Meteorological Organizations and various other bodies. All the countries under monsoon have worked together and they have brought out the achievements, whatever we see today. But still there is scope to further collaborate and hence to improve our observational systems, monitoring systems, numerical modeling, and forecasting and early warning. There has been a number of regional mechanisms in terms of the forecast development program or forecast demonstration projects in terms of uh, associated heavy rainfalls or associated impacts or in development of the modelings. But all these regionally oriented projects need to be collaborated with each other so that there could be a better coordination mechanism and understanding in the global scale. 
and certainly the exchange of knowledge from one experiment to the other will help to improve our understanding. So thank you very much for your very judicious comments and suggestions for future work in monsoon forecasting. I would now request Dr. Ruf Kumar Oli. I don't know whether Dr. Potnaik, whether Dr. Ruf Kumar. There was a message that uh, he is going somewhere. Right. Is it possible or not? Not sure. Right, sure. right. So with all these uh, um, valuable comments and suggestions for the future work on monsoon forecasting, I open the floor for comments from our distinguished delegates and participants. So anyone wants to have any comments and suggestions or any questions to the panels? Any questions to the panelists? It is open now. Are any comments or suggestions with respect to the future of monsoon forecasting? So if there is no question, so I will have one question uh, to our, my co-panelists. So there has been a significant improvement with respect to monsoon monitoring, understanding, predictions, and the forecast in different scales, from now casting to seasonal forecasting. But still there are certain uncertainties with respect to the various types of severe weather associated with um, the monsoon, especially in the regions where we have a varied socioeconomic behavior. And also, there are challenges because of the data sparse in the region. So my question is, how can we communicate the forecast and early warning in a better manner in spite of all these restraints? constraints and how can we maximize the utilization of the knowledge gained so far and what will be the future with the supposed improvement in monsoon forecasting it is open anyone can uh, respond what could be in short what could be the future of communicating the forecast and its uncertainty Associated with monsoon. Yeah, Professor Chang. You are muted. Uh, I have been thinking about uh, the, the, the problem of uh, communications to the public uh, of the <clears throat> forecast and the other meteorological uh, information and I think uh, the news media is very important in this. It used to be like uh, TV stations and newspapers, and uh, nowadays you have all this uh, website. But one idea I, I had uh, was uh, to have some sort of uh, training courses for the journalists. For instance, IMD could, uh, could give a uh, Two week or you know not not every day eight hours a day but to some sort of short training program and this way uh, you can make the journalists uh, to understand more about what's behind the forecast what are the problems the confidence level to, those sort of issues and also why sometimes forecasts are wrong and so and what sort of the correct questions they should ask. IMD, uh, so they would not ask some uh, you know, sort of questions that you, you don't know how to answer them because they don't understand the problem. So some sort of training or education program to make the journalists more knowledgeable about the forecasting, uh, the whole procedure, the problems, you know, what is a reasonable one, different difficulties, so forth. So that's my my idea. And then you can also give certificate to those uh, journalists who have received your training so they can 
uh, claim to be an expert, they would get a, a better salaries from their employers uh, because they are certified uh, uh, journalists in the area of climate and weather. Thank you, Professor Chang. Uh, uh, thank you, sir, Professor Tiagi. Well, I led to what Professor Chang has said. No doubt the National Met and Hydrological Services have to play an important role, but these needs to be complemented. No Met service can reach last men in the, in, the, in the community, particularly in the remote areas. So what we really require is, is a participation of various science NGOs and meteorological societies. Um, like in India, we have an India Meteorological Society. Uh, and also, uh, which can create a public awareness, outreach, and through the citizen science, can um, you see, provide a two-way communication uh, to the people in the field, students, including the students, where you they, they can communicate your forecast to their families, and also provide feedback about the happening of weather at that region. So this is, um, I think, the area which badly required and it is being recognized worldwide that you see improved forecasts did not and does not lead to the improvement on the ground always um, okay but the tax savvy people will make use of these forecasts but a common man may not be benefited and particularly the last man in the community the poor people who are get affected so we need a outreach system and which government agencies alone cannot do it so we need to see make use of um, NGOs, science NGOs, the professional med societies uh, to do this task. And it is very important task as good as improvement in the forecast. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tiagi. Anyone else wants to respond? Otherwise, uh, yeah, Dr. Krishnan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahapatraji. Yeah, this actually have raised a very tough question. It's not a, uh, especially the rate at which these heavy precipitation events are happening. Uh, they're happening at a very, very fast rate. And uh, because uh, last year we had a last monsoon, uh, 600 millimeters of rain in Mahabaleshwar. So that's, a, or in Chennai, we had something like a 20 centimeters of rain, which was hardly, it, it was, there was no clue. And these are very big surprises. And um, and these and these type of events are becoming more common, and in future they are projected to increase. And I think one first of all, I think uh, models are having challenges getting those type of events. Uh, tropical cyclones we, we have definitely improved by the time they form in the ocean, they grow and they make a landfall. But um, but these heavy precipitation events which lead to flooding, they are they are the big surprises. And uh, so, first of all, ability of the models to do those e events that we have to understand and how to downscale at local level and how to communicate. So there are different steps. Uh, so it is, a, I think it is something that needs a lot of thinking and planning and it, it's a, a lot of strategy is also needed. Uh, I, I really don't have an answer, but it's a very tough question that you've raised. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Mitra. Yeah, I wanted to make just one point and that we have been communicating the forecast, but uh, with this ensemble forecasting system, uh, very high resolution global and regional models, we are getting a lot of information on uncertainty. So the end user, uh, if they are educated or even the un uneducated end user, they are very intelligent and they can make use of this uncertainty. So we should give a lot of importance along with the forecast. How much is the uncertainty? Then leave it uh, to the planners, administrator, end user to make use of it. So that is like uh, developed uh, US, uh, Europe, etc., Japan. They are making use of it. But in our South Asia region, we are not making enough use of the uncertainty and giving forecast in terms of public, uh, probabilistic. We think that as a metallurgist, it's not good to convey the uncertainty, but uh, the end user needs it and they will make very nice use of it in business, in applications or 
disaster management thank you yeah professor mohanty thank you very much you are muted yeah, i agree with you, professor tagi and i feel that actually the end users should have awareness and they should have the demand and for that they have to know the limitations and its usefulness so for this purpose i feel two things one we should intimately involve the state governments and the uh, children the school children so they are the better uh, way of because uh, we don't have any course in school or anywhere about the climate money weather science and it is a such a citizen science of common people so i think uh either through society or through the imd i think we should take this knowledge to the end users to the school children and to encourage them to know this thing and communicate to the parents or to the villagers and so on because maximally the farmers and they need this uh input thank you thank you we have a question from dr brian yeah, in the chat box. Yeah, how much research is carried out in South Asia into how people respond to warnings and why? We know quite a lot about this for Europe and North America, but different cultures have different responses. And what works in Europe may have quite different results in India or Bangladesh. Whether anyone will respond? from the panel or from outside. Otherwise, I will respond to being the DGIMD. So this has become, uh, this is, you can say, a part of uh, our duty to have a survey about the response of the various kinds of users. And India Meteorological Department conducts the survey along with other sister organizations in the Ministry of Arts Sciences. The first survey we conducted in 2010, then we conducted in 2015, then we conducted in 2020. And this survey is an independent survey to evaluate the response of the public, various stakeholders, towards the forecast and warnings issued by India Meteorological Department we have initially taken off certain cases like monsoonal heavy rainfall and tropical cyclones. Afterwards, we took the applications like agro meteorological advisory services issued to the farmers, fishermen warning issued to the fishermen. So, like that. So, gradually, if I compare 2010, 2015, and 2020, we find that the response of the stakeholders and public is increasing over the years. They are appreciating the forecast information being provided. And also we've got certain comments and suggestions from them. These reports are published and survey was conducted by an independent body based on samples, National Center for Applied Economic Research. So, this is one kind of documented research that we have. In addition to that, what we do actually, we go for some kind of survey or feedback mechanism, online feedback mechanism, which is available in IMD website. And there we analyze from time to time for various stakeholders. Recently, we took the farmers, one category, and we try to evaluate what is their response with respect to the forecast being provided every week as a crop with their combined information. But they are also evaluated the mode of communications, that is audio, visual, audio, visual, textual, and also the means of communications, whether it should be radio or TV or should be the WhatsApp group. So it is really helping and what we find that um, this evaluation process with the various stakeholders has to continue. 
and that helps us to fine tune our approaches. In addition to that, also we go for some kind of physical interaction with the various stakeholders, and there also we take the feedbacks. But people appreciate the uncertainty given in our bulletin in terms of likely, very likely, most likely in the textual form about the occurrence. To some extent, they appreciate the uncertainty given the tropical cyclone track forecast, tropical cyclone wind forecast. But when we come towards heavy rainfall intensity, it is so, so drastically changing during the season itself or during the day itself, the forecast has a larger uncertainty. And with the growing demand with respect to the urban flood modeling, with respect to the river and flood modeling, with respect to the class plots, especially in the hilly regions of Northern India and Western coast and East coast, and its severe impact in terms of the landslides, mudslides, mudslips, et cetera, what people expect that there should be some kind of objective uh, mechanism to quantify the uncertainty, and that should be communicated along with the forecast. So we are trying to do that, considering both the scales like impact, expected impact, and likelihood of occurrence, according to the color codes. And for last three years, we're issuing the, some kind of impact based forecast and trying to communicate uncertainty in terms of the probability assigned to the expected event along with the color codes. But I feel still we have to go a long way to improve further the communication and quantification of the uncertainty. There is another question, uh, uh, I think, uh, from Dr. Matiketa. This question is that I have another comment of questions. As we know, we have coupled GCM for monsoon forecast, and we do bias correction focusing on the mean bias. However, we ignore the trend part. GCM have their own climate trend, which is not same as observed trend. So how to incorporate this mismatch of trend while calibrating the GCM using statistical bias correction? Dr. Mitra? Yeah, actually I chatted with him. So this trend definitely the models have when we run the model for longer uh, times, like years and decades. But in the, so he is inquiring about sub-seasonal to seasonal scale. So I have not seen much in the literature uh, trends developing uh, within a seasonal forecast, let's say three to four months, because monsoon forecast, we cannot go beyond three to four months. So if it is there, I am sure the statistical techniques, et cetera, can be used because removing a trend, it's like a systematic error, should be possible. So I am not aware uh, in the literature if uh, somebody has documented the trend in the sub-seasonal to seasonal scale. But definitely biases and uh, making a multi-model, now this AIML, this is helping. So maybe Nachigata can clarify if it is documented in some literature. So I would like to see that that within a season, three to four months of forecast, the trends develop particularly for monsoon in the model. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Actually, yes, there is very few literature right now on this scale, but these are very emerging problems, especially the monsoon forecast, uh, temperature forecast, because what happened, because we need a lot of data for statistical bias correction, but on that scale, we have like, let's say 40, 50 years of data. And especially on the ENSO prediction, monsoon prediction, each climate model, especially a couple models, have their own trend, which is not same as the observed trend, especially in different category of rainfall, like extreme rainfall, middle rainfall. So people are actually started working on that, but very few people. I was just thinking if the panel have any idea on that. Uh, otherwise, we can discuss later in different format. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahapatra. Uh, I think what Nachiket, Dr. Nachiketa was asking was, well, 
the trends in the in the biases right how the biases are evolving is that what you mean on the sub seasonal time scale is actually both a fault like you know bias obviously and also the real trend like you know that inherent climate trend within the uh, because those all this not running for 100 years but is run for at least 30 40 years as a reforecast yeah so but i think there are some work from ncmrwf they in fact they were showing the biases developed within the first six hours or something the precipitation forecast which propagate into medium and extended range time scale and um, i heard this some time ago in one of the ncmrwf presentations and they grow very quickly that's that is the problem yeah nachiketa you are telling hand cuts 30 40 years but the length of each forecast is only few months there may be data set for 30 40 years so we have to see that how fast the trend is uh, coming so i have not seen anything in the literature so we'll discuss it offline as far as i know within a season three to four months uh, i have not seen anything the trend but there must be slight trend yeah which can be corrected thank you sir thank you very much I, yeah thank you very much we are uh, coming closer to allotted time and i will just summarize now what we uh, could get the inputs towards the future of monsoon forecasting so based on all these discussions deliberations and the uh, judicious opinion by all the panelists uh, what we find that the future of monsoon forecasting is uh, quite bright and we can hope for better forecast and better service to the community we can also hope for minimizing further the loss of lives and properties from the vagaries of monsoon the way forward for the purpose what i find that we have to go for the augmented observational network, especially addressing the data space region, the sea areas, and the hills. The second step would be the further augmentation in our process studies so that we address all the physical processes to understand the monsoon all time scales and the space scales. The next step will be the development of the better numerical modeling system, which is an ongoing process with the higher and higher resolutions, data assimilations, incorporation of various physical processes, development of the various types of forecast products with post-processing, and hence its conversion into a better public weather service with quantification of uncertainty and explicit application of the forecast values. While doing so, parallelly there will be a knowledge base developed from the data science, especially the artificial intelligence and machine learning, both will be complementing as a dual engine, and hence we will have a better pre-processing post-processing, development of products, decision-making, and communication to the various stakeholders. There will be a need for uh, a seamless forecasting, understanding of the scale of our properties, diagnosis. We will also need a better collaboration and coordination among the various countries, the various research labs, operational centers so that we can have a direct transfer of knowledge from research to operations in all scales. We should have a direct mechanism for communicating among the regional monsoon centers so that really the regional monsoon centers act coherently with the global monsoon centers and by that way, the centers like IMPO can do a major role. Further, if I look at, say, for the next 10 years, as you see now, the forecast generated by the numerical models and various statistical tools, including data, AIML, etc., 
are aiming at converting the analog process to an automated process. So thereby, the role of forecasting, the nature of forecasting, will gradually be converted from an analog manner, from a human intensive mechanism to a machine intensive mechanism with complete automations. And at that time, perhaps the role of forecasters will change and forecasters will be playing a role of a basic interpreter, analyzer, enabler for the various stakeholders by providing a direct model output with various kinds of statistical applications. Perhaps that is the future for the monsoon forecasting and all of us have to work towards that direction. And I hope with this international collaboration on monsoon, with this continued effort through these international workshops like IWM7, we will be able to achieve this goal. So thank you very much, all my distinguished panelists for their active contribution and all the distinguished delegates for their suggestions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahapatra sir, for chairing this wonderful session. It was a really challenging discussion to the issue of monsoon forecasting future and also there are very good deliberation on the issue. And uh, yes, definitely to its, as you last you have summarized, yes, in future it is good, then monsoon forecasting will improve in future with the uh, IMPO, IATM and international community taking many uh, activities and research on this area. Thank you. With this actually we conclude the panel discussion part. And uh, as you know, I'll come to the next item. As you know, Indian Mass Society also at the I mean, in cooperation with all other thing involved in this IMS, sorry, IMW. So this is international workshop of monsoon, and uh, you know the uh, that uh, this is the society also bringing out the bulletin, means that is international society bulletin that is called biomandal uh, once in six month regularly, and uh, the professor S K Das he has taken over this charge of the chief executive editor of this uh, journal for last uh, four or five years and now it is very regular and we are bringing out so on this occasion uh, we would like to release one volume of the, this uh, by mandal that the that is number volume number 47 number two so now i request uh, professor das sir our uh, president sir i am as president dr m Apata, sir and i am having copy to release this uh, book on this occasion Yeah, so this is the main hard work of Dr. Skidas, sir, and our also uh, executive editor, Dr. Kamaljit, madam. Thank you, sir. You'd like to so say... For the, for the, yeah. for the knowledge of uh, uh, our international community, I just want to mention that Biomandal is the official publication of Indian Meteorological Society. Biomandal is a Hindi word. Its meaning is atmosphere. So therefore, it publishes all types of literature dealing with the atmospheric sciences, especially the weather and climate sciences. I should appreciate and express my gratitude to Professor S. K. Das, who is the editor of this biomandal. The scope of biomandal has been ever increasing. Biomandal, all the copies you can find out online and we are trying now to make it completely online journals in the near future. It is helping the young minds to publish their literature and also it is helping for further r and I am sure the Indian Metallurgical Society will continue to improve this biomandal to the international standard. Thank you. Do you so, want to speak, Professor Das? Just uh, one I minute. Just, uh, I, thank you so much. Uh, I would just like to tell to the, inform the international community, those who might not know about Vaimandar, that the two volumes uh, are available on the website of IMS Society, www.imssociety.org, under publication head. Uh, first uh, issue of every year is available by 30th June, without fail the early version or the online version. 
And the second issue is available by end of the year, that is December. And uh, this uh, particular volume is the latest one, that is 47.2, 47, 47 volume, second issue of the year. And uh, it was already available, it is already available on the website because uh, this is for the period uh, July to December. But the printing takes some time, the hard copy, and that is why we're releasing today. Also, we're waiting for some good occasion so that uh, it will be known to the uh, international community. I invite uh, all the distinguished scientists to submit their papers or review articles. This has regular uh, sections like uh, two or three or four review articles then some original scientific papers, and then and some reports about the extreme weather in India for the winter phase and the summer phase, and uh, also the reports from the events of each chapter. There are 32 chapters of IMS over India. And uh, then the, well, we welcome the new members. So I request uh, all the scientists to contribute uh, because it can be published within five, six months without fail. And I thank my uh, committee, uh, editorial committee, it's consisting of uh, executive director, uh, editor, editor Kamaljit, Dr. Kamaljit Ray, and managing editor, our secretary of IMS, uh, Dr. Patnaik, dear Patnaik, and the reviewers for their timely response and overall to the IMS National Council and uh, specifically the authors and the scientists I request to, to submit uh, review articles. With these words, uh, I thank everybody and uh, expect that we'll get some good articles uh, from the international community. <coughs> there are some papers coming from uh, Indonesia, Bangladesh, uh, Thailand, uh, uh, countries nearby India, we are getting regular for Russia also, Russia, and I request others to please contribute and help the uh, this uh, particular. This is a very very old uh, for several years it has been published. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <coughs> so, yeah. So last item, sir. Uh, should I go for vote of thanks? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. So it is a really it is honor for me to give formal vote of thanks. And it is a really plenty of people to I must thank because organizing such an event is not very easy. So both at international level and national level and also the other department. So let me first thank uh, our honorable minister, Dr. Jitendra Singh Ji for kindly value, spending valuable time and also in the recording message he could not attend due to the parliament session, but uh, he can, he has sent the video message and very, very encouraging what, what are the government of India is doing for the monsoon research and monsoon mission. So we are thankful to him. Then our secretary general of WMO, Dr. Patrick, Professor Patrick Talas, he has also given a very good uh, overview of the monsoon and what are the WMO is doing for the severe weather forecasting. And also he has encouraged how the India government is hosting this one and also the monsoon research related thing. So we are thankful to him and also the, their secretarial staff of the WMO that Jiro uh, Jina Kahana and Toeng Peng. So both of them, I was in constant touch with them for all the uh, thing uh, that we could do with the WMO. Then our secretary MOA, Dr. M. Ravichandran sir and the entire MOS, they have supported from the beginning and other it would not be possible to organize such an event. So we are getting continuous guidance and support. We are having some NOC meeting time to time. So we are thankful to all the MOS support. Then I'm coming to the our uh, our DGM sir and PR of India, Dr. M. Mahapatra sir, without his guidance and support, it not been possible to organize such an event in IMD. Because yes, it was very difficult for IMD also to organize such a virtual platform in a bigger scale. And yes, it was, uh, his support and guidance that help us to plan and also uh, execute the plan and successfully for completion of the plan. So everything went well. So it was a very guidance. So thank you. And also the finally for uh, 
allowing a special issue of motion to be a, as a proceedings of uh, this IWM7. So that special issue that will be also give visibility to the international committee and uh, the monsoon, monsoon research. So thank you very much, sir. Then our co-chair of international committee, Professor C.P. Chang, Dr. Ajit Tyagi, in the scientific, uh, scientific program committee, uh, like Dr. Ikari, Dr. Joe, and uh, Dr. Rupukumar, we used to have all interaction for planning of this session from uh, last three, four months, how to do, what are the type of session, how to get the time, time lag, et cetera. There were many issues, how many invited, oral, short oral, but we have not uh, that rejected any papers. So we have accommodated either in short oral poster or poster. Uh, and there are 38 uh, invited talks. It was very good uh, covering entire uh, monsoon of entire globe. So we must thank all the scientific committee and also the all the contributors, all the contributors and the chairs for contributing such a very um, valuable uh, document as uh, Dr. Mitra Sar was telling that this will be in future also very helpful. Then WWRP head and WCRP head, Dr. Estelle and Dr. Michael Spire, they also came and uh, they gave their uh, uh, comments and how the monsoon research should improve and uh, that they are working with IMPO and uh, other things. So we, we also thank WRP and WCRP. Then coming to our IATM colleagues, they have organized successfully this IMPO, this training was up particularly that was event organized in November. Otherwise, in physical mode, it is just adjacent to our IWM7 was up. It would have been arranged, but anyway, that was in arranged in November. November in IMPO, Dr. Rupa Kumar, Dr. Krishnan, and the IMPO team from IITM, they have worked hard, and we are also part of that team. That was also very successfully arranged, so I must thank all of them. Then uh, our local team in IMD, our interstate division, Dr. Giri, our MHA, MEA, and our uh, this IT team, Dr. New, our new colleagues, they work on this thing, how to uh, work for a basic physical, uh, means not in the absence of physical thing, how we can manage this one so our technical team uh, yes i can name few dr arulalan dr bushe dr vidas dr giri dr sony and administration type and many things so i might have missed some names so i cannot take all the names so i i'm each and everyone i am very much thankful to you for all the support that we have got in arranging this such a wonderful session uh, and five days uh, and uh, i must thank everybody international community and also the national those who have contributed for successful arranging of the event. Thank you. So before we close, I'll just request all of you to kindly switch on the camera so that we can at least take a snapshot of the participants in the concluding session. Yeah, you multiple people can take the snap also. Yeah, please. can collect all the snaps and choose the best. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I've taken two. So with this, I think, thank you very much. Nice to see you sometime in physical mode, in, maybe in near future or after few, one or two years. We must like to have some physical discussion, physical training that also we needed. <coughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, sir. अरे अच्छा हो गया ठीक हो गया यार है ना अच्छा भाई एक सेकंड में जस्ट एक सेकंड